Yeah, that is a hooray. Okay. Uh, all right, so Jordan had a question. And I even remember what the question is. So let me uh, share. Today is not a good day for technology, I suppose. All right. Okay. So uh, here is memory. And in this picture, memory is eight bytes wide. Okay. So an item in the memory area is eight bytes. Now to start, when your function enters, the stack pointer has some value and perhaps that value is pointing here. Now, interestingly, you have to remember that the stack grows towards smaller addresses. So when the stack grows, it's the minus 16, for example. So the stack, if this is address zero, and this is address really big, the stack grows in this direction and it shrinks in this direction, okay? So a growth is when the stack becomes a smaller number. All right, now on the ARM, 64-bit machines, changes to the stack must be multiples of 16, or let's write that out, two times eight. The eight comes from the width of an address. 64-bit machine means you have a 64-bit address space. The length of an address is eight bytes. Two times eight is 16. On this ARM processor, you can only manipulate the stack in multiples of 16. So let's begin with a uh, one of several examples. So example number one, is wrong instruction. Example number one, str of some X register into onto the stack having first remo uh, reduced the stack's value by 16. So what's gonna happen is the new stack pointer is here. Each of these rows of boxes is eight bytes. So the new stack pointer is here. Let's draw that line. And Xn is gonna get put there. Sorry, it's gonna be put here on the stack. Okay. Now, had this been an STP, there would have been two registers, XN and XM. So X, XN would be the second one, and the first one would be XM. So Jordan, this should be sufficient to answer your original question. Okay, now I'd like to give you uh, another sample. I have a quick question. Please, Cephas. Does the stack grow automatically whenever you call store or do you have to manually do it? It is a manual, uh, the stack, 
can be manipulated like any other register. You could, for instance, say uh, uh, subtract from the stack pointer 16. And that word, uh, you, it, let me finish this example. You can then str of xn to the stack pointer. These two instructions together equals, well, just to make it so that it does equal, I'll make that an STP and an XM also. So these two instructions together is the same as that one. So if you have to manually manage the stack, is there really significant difference between the stack and heap then? Since there really aren't. Well, there's a dramatic difference uh, between the stack and the heap in that, first of all, which lens pair of lenses are you using? If you're using the lens of a higher level language, then the stack is manipulated without your uh, any effort on your part. But then if you look at how the, imp the higher level language is implemented, that's the first time you're aware of the stack growing and shrinking. Okay, so uh, there's a huge difference between the stack and the heap in another way in that the, the stack can only add at one place and it can only shrink in one place. Whereas the heap, you can allocate things in memory and they remain there even if you deallocate things in between. You understand the difference, Cephas? Okay, I think I get it. Okay. So that actually brings up my, my question then. So you said that we can you can only uh, change change the stack in one place. So why why do we have to have XM? Like why um why can't we just do XN? Okay, so uh, what I meant by changing the stack only in one place, meaning uh, what I meant is the stack is a stack. You can only push on top and you can pop on top. Whereas the heap, it's random access. You could delete something in the middle, but that's not true on the stack. You can only the top or take a question leads to another discussion that we should have. You're programming in a higher level. All, of all right. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes. Yeah. All right. So, when you are programming in a higher level language, you think of all of your local variables as being in memory. Now, some of them are, but some of them may not be. They may be stored in a register only. Now, that is a, a, a good example of design by you as the programmer. You, as the programmer, can figure out how many local variables do I need? And can I arrange for them all to be held in registers? If the answer is no, then you start using the stack for local variables. If the answer is yes, you have found as the programmer, the master of all the code you see, you found a way to put all your local variables in a register you don't need access to memory other than perhaps to save the X30. And that's a huge performance win. Remember that the, the registers are a thousand times faster than memory. So we have not seen yet an example of a local variable in uh, RAM. Okay, so suppose you had uh, a struct and it was something big. Actually, it doesn't really matter what it is. 
struct big B. And this is in, it's a local variable. Does everybody agree it's a local variable? Okay. Now, let's say the struct big is something really big. Who knows? Maybe it's, maybe it's 4,000 bytes. Clearly, you can't put 4,000 bytes on, uh, into a register or even all of the registers together. There's still not 4,000 bytes. But the higher level language allows you to create a struct that's 4,000 bytes. So by the way, so let's just stipulate size of B would return 4,000. Okay. Uh, let's just do a quick uh, calculator. And 4,000, oh, please let me get lucky and 4,000 is uh, divisible by 16. Oh, it is. No, wait, I'm in computer calculator mode. So let me make sure I'm in the basic. Okay, so 4,000 divided by 16 is not. So 4,000 divided by 16 is 266.6. I'm getting an even number. Uh, let me do it again. 4,000 divided by 16 is 250. Good. I was right. So who knows? I typed in something wrong. So is 4,000 divisible by 16? The answer is yes. So if you wanted to use this local variable, there would be at foo, there would be an str or stp, let's do p, Thirty, and the same syntax as always. Okay, and now in order, now that you've done that, now let's allocate on the stack four thousand bytes. Okay, so that would be something like subtract sp. Four thousand. So let's look at memory. Originally, the stack was pointing here. The first instruction moved the stack pointer here, and you put x nineteen and x thirty here. And then subsequently, that subtract moves the stack pointer. And here is now all of B. I have a question again. I'm thrilled. So I, I think I ought to probably know this after OS, but once you say like subtract 4,000, is the stack space completely allocated beforehand or is doing this operation calling some sort of memory allocation. Uh, yes, you should know this from OS. <laughs> uh, and the answer is you have not seen it. Well, the answer is first, let's digress and talk about allocating memory because there's two contexts here for the word allocating. One is uh, allocating user memory, like using new and delete and new and malloc, right? But then there's this other meaning to allocate, which is for the operating system itself to add uh, accessible memory to your process's address space. Now we haven't gone into that at all, but you did in operating systems. So what uh, the allocation or the addition of usable memory to the address space will happen 
uh, will be handled by the operating system at the first time something in B is accessed. Ah, okay. Right. So the, so OS, is, the, the OS is provisioning the extra space. Yes. So when unallocated memory is accessed by the user task, it causes a trap into the operating system which if it's the stack, will just add more space. Presumably it's okay to do so. It'll just add more space to the uh, address space of, your, of the running task. Okay, do you remember that now, Cephas? Yes, mostly, <laughs> okay. but I get it. Thank How did you. Cephas pass operating systems without passing beats, this class first? Be, beats the hell out of me. <sighs> So, well, he, 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 he did well. What that suggests is for all the bluster and all the bite, all the bark is I, as a grade, when I actually assign grades, I'm actually a softie. Okay. So you have to earn an F with me. Okay. So. So the stack is, after doing this, the stack pointer is here. So all of the members of B will be positive offsets off of the stack, right? Because here are the smaller numbers. So those are the negative offsets, don't go there. So the members of B, let's say here's, here's a member of B, that is going to be the stack pointer plus this amount. Okay. Any questions about the stack? Any questions about using the stack for local variables? Uh, how do we kind of more like asking how do we set those up properly? Because I, it, if you mentioned it, it probably went completely over my head. Well, we did an example on Tuesday. Uh, we did the example of uh, the function call which dynamically allocated a struct and then filled in the struct. Let's switch over to that and refresh our memory. Can I just ask a question real quick? Yes, you can. That uh, 4,000 subtract and then readjusting the stack pointer. So that's assuming that the, the 4,000 bytes will all be filled by the struct. You already know that it's going to be a 4,000 byte struct. So you're doing that movement to change where the stack pointer points to so that you can fill downward as you go Correct. small. Correct. Okay. Yeah, but rem just remember downward in the picture means towards higher addresses. Higher addresses. Okay. Right. Right. So let's take a look once again at Okay, so let's take a look once again at um, the example found in the language concepts function calls Let's remind ourselves what the struct looks like. And here it is. What you see in the comments on the right-hand side is sa says that the member A long starts out zero bytes away from a pointer to the struct. A long is eight bytes long. So the next one, doesn't matter what type it is, the next one will start, start eight bytes away from the pointer to the struct. Now, an int is four bytes. So eight plus four is 12. That's where the next member will start. So if the 
address of the struct, the base address of the struct is uh, 100,000. Then 100,012 is where you'll find the value for a short. Now let's take a look at that in the assembly language. Okay, this is putting a 64, a value of 64 into the eight bytes immediately starting at where the struct was allocated. In other words, the offset of zero. Okay, so there it is. The starting address, the base address of the struct, which was allocated by the malloc. That is the long. The value of 64 is going into the long, zero bytes offset from the start of the struct. Now here's a value of 32, which is gonna go into eight bytes away from the start of the struct. The next value is a short and it starts 12 bytes away from the struct. So, so are, you, are you getting how structs work now? In ARM, absolutely not. Another way you could do this is instead of like specifying the byte offset every time, couldn't you do that while actually incrementing X itself? Like yeah, of course when you can. You do Okay. Yeah, of course you can. I suppose it's probably a good idea to keep the original address though or something. Well, it depends on what your code is supposed to do. All right, now, someone other than Tom, do you get um, this? I, I have actually a question. So we're moving 64 into X1, right? And then we're storing the the value of x here, which is like the start of the struct into x1. So so why are we why are we first putting 64 into x1 if we're immediately overriding it with another okay value? Uh, so you're parsing the instruction a little bit uh, badly. So the it, so these two instructions uh, am I thank you. Why does it take so long? Okay, so we have move of x1 uh, getting the value of 64. So the way to read this is 64 goes into x1. And then there was a store of x1 This, the arrow goes the other way. This is a store into the memory location pointed to by X zero. Okay, so does store always go left to right then? Correct. Okay, I think that's why I wasn't giving. That, I, that's what I figured. Okay, now let's do an example of a three operand uh, uh, instruction. Add so this says take three and add it to X two and put the value in X three. So once again, the order is right to left. Could I ask a question? Yes. Um, so in your struct code, you don't have to pull it up because I remember what it was, but um, initially before your BL uh, allocate and before you started allocating any of the four data types that were in the struct, you had a move X zero register comma 16. Why were you initializing a 16 in X zero before setting up any of the values of the struct? Okay, then, yeah, we'll have to uh, take a look at the code. Ah, okay. Well, uh, malloc 
requires one argument. And uh, the, the, that argument is the number of bytes to allocate. So the structure has a total size of, a total length of 16 bytes. Yes. So this is setting up the parameter for malloc. Okay. Okay, remember. Uh, Makes a, the first parameter as the parameter, I remember that. Okay. So remember, first parameter goes in a register ending with zero. Mm -hmm. Second parameter ends in a register ending in one. Now, which type of register? That depends on the type of the value. Mm -hmm. An address will always go into an X. A long will always go into an X. All others will go into a W if they're integer types, mm -hmm. uh, or they will go into one of the floating point types. So. Okay? I think I asked this, this question in an earlier class, but I don't remember the answer precisely. Is it the end of the world if I store an int in an X register? No. It's not, okay. No. So why should but, I put it in a W then? Well, if you're interoperating with, and this is the answer I gave you, if you're interoperating with another function, that function has a specification. If its parameter is expecting to be an int, you should send it as an int. Okay. Okay, now we are going to do the document that I have been intending to do since the second day of class. And where will I find it? Reference, ARM instruction set. Okay. Okay. So we have talked about the difference between W and X. W, N, and X, N are the same register. The W is just the bottom 32 bits of the X. Okay. Now, there are floating point values as well. So here is a single precision floating point register, the S's. The ARM also supports half, uh, half uh, resolution, half, um, half precision floats. Those are the H's. And also there's a, uh, a byte size. That, that way of getting at the registers. But so single precision is 32 bits. Double precision is drawn really badly. Uh, it's uh, 64 bits and check it out. The Q registers are 128 bits long. A Q register is 16 bytes. Okay, moving on. We will come back to uh, we will come back to the floating point when it, it's appropriate. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Conceivably, could you store anything in the floating point registers, or are they automatically like encoded in? I don't remember exactly how floating point does this okay. thing, but are they all encoded like that? Well, floating point numbers are encoded. But everybody remember, pay attention right now because the answer to Cephas's question will be an important part of a future project. So his question is, can you use one of these ginormous floating point registers for anything or do, can it only be floating point? Is that paraphrasing your question, Cephas? That seems like an accurate summation, yes. Okay, now the important thing to remember is the answer is yes, you could stick any collection of bits you want there. Okay. But it just has to fit. Well, it, the, the but is if 
you want to use a floating point instruction on a queue register, well, then it needs then it will be interpreted as a float, uh, as a floating point value. But if all you're doing, for example, is moving things in and out of memory, then you can leverage the enormous size of a queue register. Cool. Okay. Okay. Now, let's take a look at some of the basic arithmetic and logic operators. Now, introspect yourself and, and just say, boy, I was a responsible student. My professor told me 47 times, or maybe it was 91 times, I'm not quite sure, to read this document and you already have, so this is review. Okay, so- I have read, add, I didn't understand it. Okay, so an add instruction, let's add together A and B. Okay. Now notice it's w, w registers and the way to read this is W0, I can't actually click on these. So W0 is being added to W1 and put in W0. Now, how do I know that W is appropriate? As I come over here and I look at the type. Are you able to see my cursor, by the way, moving around? Good. Yeah, we're able to see it. So a 32-bit integer is a W register. Compare that here. Here's a 64-bit, and it's we want to compute A minus 1. So here is an X register. You read this, and notice in the, in the manuals, you see a, a, a octothorpe in front of the number, and the assembler doesn't require that you actually put the octothorpe in. So this says, subtract one from X zero, that makes it 64 bits and add, uh, and I'm sorry, subtract one from X zero, put the result in X zero. In our, so for project one, this is a really quick question. When we're deconstructing the C code, do you want us to specify like 32 bit integer, 64 bit integer, or just standard int? Yeah, no, no. Uh, Part of the goal of project one is to get you to force you to think about uh, the different widths of operands. So you have to implement it exactly as you see it, right? You, so, so Jordan, you can't in your solution uh, just uh, uh, take something which is declared as an int and use it as a long. So if it's declared as an int, you have to use it like an int. Okay. Now in the future, you can relax that constraint. But for this project, part of the point of the project is that you can tell what the right kind of register is to use. Okay. Uh, so, let's take- I have another question. Yeah, please. This is kind of like vague, but do, will we actually get into vector and SIMD shenanigans or is that? Absolutely. Ooh. Yes. Okay, that's it. Uh, and there is some lip service to vector instructions, SIMD instructions in the text that I skipped over. So we will, we will have a project which requires you to to do vectorization and use, quote, SIMD, unquote, instructions. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I saw it. I yeah. saw it. One yeah. more sentence about it is on the ARM and on the ARM processor, the SIMD instructions have a brand name of NEON. So when I say the NEON instruction set, those are vector additions to the basic instruction set on an ARM processor. Now, here's an interesting one. There are a small number of instructions that take four operands. So here's multiply and add. And it turns out 
that this construction here, C equals, uh, I'm sorry, C plus A times B is done so frequently, it was worth having a dedicated instruction for it. Does anybody know which of the classes on campus where you do that operation, C plus A times B constantly? Math. It's a math course, keep going. Um, be like calc one physics, stuff. linear algebra. Just linear. Yeah, yeah, linear algebra. Linear algebra all day long. You're doing something like uh, a constant plus something times something. That's part of doing the uh, elimination and uh, solving of matrices. Okay, let's move on. Now here, it says that an S can be added to the operation to set flags. So for example, add becomes adds. So this can help you eliminate an instruction. Uh, the testing against equal to zero, less than zero or greater than zero like branch not equal, uh, branch greater than, branch greater than or equal, those branches are conditional upon condition codes. So you can get an add instruction to set those codes and then you could follow with a branch rather than doing a compare and then a branch. Okay, so that's an option. Okay, there are two move instructions that uh, are, are fun to look at right now. This is the one you've seen so far. This is putting a one into X zero, but there's also move negated. So negated means turn all the zeros into ones, all the ones into zeros before you do the move. Okay. We'll talk for a bit about the floating point. The floating point instructions begin with F. Okay. All 64-bit ARM processors will have floating point built in. I'm gonna skip section 7.3, but these are instructions which can consider groups of bits together, like bit field insert, bit field extract. There are instructions which do bit or byte swizzling. So swizzling is uh, reordering. Okay, so for instance, if you wanted to exchange data with an Intel processor, the ordering of the bytes on the Intel processor is different from the ordering of the bytes for, uh, the, for the same integer as the ordering of the bytes on the ARM machine. So swizzling instructions are, are good to have. You might also use the swizzling instructions in graphics. There are a number of uh, instructions that are designed to be used when doing casting. So for example, here is uh, SXTB. This will do a sign extended conversion of a byte because of the B in W0 into a 32-bit value in W1. So there's two ways when you have a signed number, uh, when you have a number and you want to make it bigger, there are two choices. You can either sign extend or zero extend. Let us flip over and draw pictures. Uh, all we see is a black screen currently.
I think we might have lost him. Yeah. Uh, I'm back. Welcome back. I missed you. Yes, but what that means is our recording is now screwed. Oh. Uh, no, it says it's still recording. Okay, good. But I'm not me again. I guess Gabe is the... Uh, well, uh, I'm seeing double. <laughs> yeah, who is the who is the uh, moderator right now? Oh, I'm the host now. Thank you. Unbelievable. Unfriggin' believable. All right, I'm waiting to share my screen again. Thank you. Holy shit. All right. Um, sign extension. So if you were to look at the bits of negative one, if you were to look at the bits, what would it be? And let's say it's a char C equals negative one. What would the bits in C look like? It's one byte, right? Since it's a charge. Yeah, one byte. So it would be eight bits. Of a bit? What? It would be a fourth of a bit. Well, no, uh, it'll be eight bits because it's a char. And those eight will be ones. So in hex, this would be zero x f f. Okay, so in binary, this Who's would be one, 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 one. So now you want to do this. You want to say int uh, i is equal to, and you want to cast c to an integer. So you want to take the 8-bit value and you want to make it a 32-bit value. So if you look at the picture of the 32-bit value, here's one byte, here's another byte, here's another byte. So you've got ones over here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, if you simply zero extended this, the integer value would no longer be negative one. It would be 255. If you zero, if you flood all of this with zeros, it changes the sense of negative one into an unsigned. However, if you sign extend, then if this is negative, which it is, then all of this would become negative uh, ones so that the integer version of negative one is tr still negative one. Does that make sense? Okay, so coming back. Wouldn't that document. work with any other number? Um, so if I if it, if it was like a negative three, would it still do the same thing with sign extend? Correct. So the negative by sign extending a signed value, the uh, the interpretation of the value remains the same. If you zero extend as if it was an unsigned value, that means your negative one becomes a 255 or your negative three becomes a 252 or something like that. So if you sign extend, it tries to keep track of what you had before? Right, if, it's, if it began as negative, it'll stay as negative. Okay. Uh, okay, what you're seeing here 
is if you need to do, we're going to skip this, move on to more other things. Now, here's where you're casting between floats and doubles and integers. The instruction is, this is a signed conversion to float. Uh, here is a convert of a float to a signed value. So those are the instructions that you use when you're casting from an int to a float and a float to an int. Okay. So we're gonna skip vector for now. Let's get to loads and stores. And this will be review for you. So if it's uh, eight bytes, 16 bytes or 32, sorry, eight bits, 16 bits or 32 bits, you're using a W register. If it's 64 bits, you're using an X register. For the sizes uh, operating on things other than long and int, you need to specify a fourth letter, a fourth letter. And this, the B says work on uh, load eight bits uh, or store eight bits. And this says the H says 16 bits. Okay. Uh, more about sign extending when you do a load. So if you add the additional uh, S, so this will be, uh, the B says it's eight bits, but it's gonna be sign extended to fill a W register. So that will take your, uh, the, what you see out here, that takes your negative number, and I can tell it's negative, because it begins with the first bit turned on uh, and it's going to sign extend it all the way out to 32 bits because it was a W. Okay, now this is review also. This is a load of 32 bit value from the memory location specified by X1. Okay. You can also specify an offset, which we saw when we were working with the struct. This will add 12 to the value of X1 and then use the summed result as the address, the effective address of where to load from. So this is loading. 32 bits, you can tell that because it's a W, from 12 bytes away from the address in X1. Now that's different in this picture. This is that pre-increment syntax. The previous one did not change the value of X1. The addition of 12 was internal. With this syntax, 12 is added to X1, put back in X1, and then that value is used as the location from which to draw a 32-bit value. Here is the post indexed. So in this case, X1 is used as the address immediately. And then 12 is added to it and put back in X1. So that's a post indexed. Here are your pairs instructions. We've gone over them. Okay. 
Uh, we'll skip these as these are floating point. Let's get to the branch instructions. So if you've seen, you have seen B with a label, that's an unconditional branch. That is exactly a go-to. If you use B, okay, I, I, I misread that. I thought that was gonna be BL. We'll skip the, uh, no, no, we don't have to skip. Uh, notice that it's B label, right? So that means a go to the label. But suppose you had the address of an instruction in a register. You can also go to based upon the contents of a register and that's BR. There are also conditional branches. The syntax here is presented a little differently than the Linux assembler is expecting. This says B dot condition and we would use B condition. So BGE for branch if greater than or equal to. Okay. There's a couple of shortcuts. This is CBZ. So compare a register, look at a register and branch to the label if the register is zero. Uh, professor, how does the BGE check the thing? Does it just look at the most recent statement and go off of that? The condition codes, remember I talked about condition codes? Failing. So it's based upon the last, well, it was only a few minutes ago, Tom. I have the worst retention for this and I don't okay. know why and I hate it. The, uh, okay, so when you have an instruction like subtract, the result of the subtraction could be less than or equal to, less than zero, equal to zero, greater than zero. But a subtract does not set any of those condition codes. If instead you use S, instead of SUB, you used SUBS, it would set the condition codes so that a subsequent instruction can test the condition codes and make some choices. So there are two shortcuts. Compare a value of a register to zero and branch if it is zero or branch if it's not zero. The TBZ and TBNZ, that tests an individual bit. So in X, in the X register, uh, this can say, um, is the seventh bit a one or a zero? So that's for testing an individual bit. Okay, now I've done examples like this in the uh, examples that I've given, but let's take a look at these anyway. So if A is five, set B to five. So look, uh, A is in W zero. So compare five to uh, what's in A. If they're not equal, branch not equal to this label. So if you executed this instruction, it must be because they were equal, check the C code, that's what you were after. And then you could use that W8 in the future and see if it was ever changed. And if it was changed, you know that that condition was triggered? Yes, yes, uh, that's true, you could do that. So I know you said this earlier, but I forgot, what is the, the Octothorpe do the, the pound symbol? Uh, so in the ARM documentation, when they have a literal number, they put the Octothorpe in front of it. But the new assembler that we use on Linux doesn't require the Octothorpe. So uh, you can see, so 
just just delete the octothorpe wherever you see it in arm documents all right okay so here's a while loop while a doesn't equal to zero do some stuff so in this uh they're telling us that w8 contains a so they're comparing a to zero and if it is zero, the loop is over. Look over here, while A isn't zero. So the loop is over when A is zero, right? So compare and branch, branch if it's zero. So W8 must have A. If it is zero, skip out. So go out to skip and that is breaking the loop. So if you get here, it must be because A is not zero. So you add to B and you subtract from A, branch unconditionally back to the top of the loop. Okay, questions? Hey, this is uh, what I just talked about. When you add an S to an uh, to a math instruction, that will cause the condition bits to be set. All right. Now, In general, we, we probably won't use this instruction much, but it is kind of cool that it's there. This is your ternary operator, but it's simplified. So let me, um, let me uh, share my iPad. Maybe Zoom won't crash. Okay, let me move this. Good. Um, so this is sea cell by the seashore x d comma x n comma x m comma and the condition okay <laughs> so this is going to be like if uh no not, not going to be like that. It's going to be some condition, question mark, x, uh, which comes first? D, oh, uh, n, OK. x, n, colon, x, m. OK, now you've all seen the, the ternary operator before. So this is present in C and C++. No, this says- I don't think I've seen this thing before. If the condition is true, the value of this expression is that value. If this is false, the value of the expression is that value. And that's what the C cell instruction does. Wait, how do you specify a condition? Well, let's take a look. If the condition code, which was set by a previous instruction, in this case was uh, the zero bit was set. The, uh, uh, the Are you on the other screen? Because we still have a yep, JPEG. Yep, yep, yep. Thank you, thank you. It gets confusing. Okay, so some instruction will set the condition bits. In this case, compare of W1 to zero. This says if, it, if W1 was zero, use W6, put it in W5. Otherwise, use W7 and put it in W5. So what is the EQ? The EQ refers to the previous? E Right, the condition codes were set in the compare instruction and then tested in the following instruction. 
EQ says this, the, that W1 was equal to the literal. Because a compa folks, compare, the compare instruction is a subtract without a destination. So actually, I can give you the real definition of, um, all right, so, hello. No, screw this. We hear you. Back. We yeah, hear you. No, I, I, my computer needs to hear me. Okay, so, um, okay, so compare of x1 to x2 is actually a meta instruction. It actually is implemented as subs, that means set the condition codes, where the zero register is the destination. Now the zero register can't be written to. So that it's like a no op. So this says subtract x2 from x1, set the condition codes. And this instruction is the same as that instruction. Okay, let's see what else we got. So do the like the compare operators, do they always do they always store uh, the result or whatever in EQ? Yeah, well, there are several bits in the status register. So there's the EQ bit, the uh, uh, not uh, equal, uh, and then the less than and the greater than. So I suppose in actual reality, there is no, okay. So what does equal mean? Uh, so if you've got these three bits, so A equals B means this bit is turned on and uh, this bit is off and this bit is off. That's equal. Okay. What about greater than or equal to? That means this bit is turned on and this bit is turned on. That bit is not. So uh, for the seesaw, would we just do an uh, and? If you wanted to make sure that it was both greater than and equal to, or I mean greater than and something else, or less than or? Well, like, I wanted to check if it was, like you'd have to use the bar. Right, so GT is greater than, but GE is greater than or equal to. So are those, are those all actually extant? Like, are, they are they symbols? What? Are they symbols that we can use, or do we have to use uh, logic operators? No, no. The, these are the symbols you use. Okay. Okay. Is that like a index of them all somewhere? I imagine. Uh, yes, there is. Uh, earlier in this document, I passed over it where I was talking about the. Yeah, it, it's earlier in this document. Okay. Uh, now, function calls, we've gone over. Okay. So, but let's, let's look at it here as well. So, branch with the link register. BL means call a function. And it means that you're expecting to return. So, BL to foo saves. You see that little, uh, uh, this, this dashed line? That's an Where instruction. Your iPad still. Son of a gun. <laughs> okay. So BL, you're seeing the right thing now, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. BL puts, BL calculates the address of this instruction and puts that in X30, then changes the program counter to the address of this instruction. That is what it means to call a function. The function executes, 
then the return, the return instruction takes X30's contents and moves it to the program counter. Therefore, going back to the next instruction after the call. Then the, the thing to look at is uh, how our parameters passed. And we've talked about this a great deal as well. I have a Good question. question. Good oh, question. Yes. Um, so when you, when in uh, the function three example, when you called BL malloc, it sends the, uh, the instructions to the malloc function and, and the malloc function sends back that uh, program counter. That's what happens there. Well, not exactly. Uh, the, uh, the, the words you used um, um, weren't quite the right words. So let me uh, switch here. I'm gonna stop using that, That's, that sucks. Okay. So this was a move into X zero of 16 and then a BL to Malik. Yes. Now, uh, Malik is defined in the following way. It is a void star Malik size T. Okay, that's the signature of Malik. Okay. Now a size T is an unsigned long. So from this signature, you know that it takes one parameter, right? Yep. That means it's the parameter is going to be in a zero register. And you know that it's going to be in an X because of the long. Yeah, it's long. Yeah. Right. So this is putting 16 up here. Is putting 16 in X zero. That's low into X zero, meaning 16 is the value of the parameter going to malloc. Yeah, but what I was basically asking is you said BL assumes a return from the function, but since this is a void, then what it would not be assuming a return in this case? Well, no, 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 a, a void assumes no return. Uh, what, what I meant is, uh, well, I, I, a few things. One, when I mm -hmm. said, BL to malloc means that it's a function call and at some point that function should return. Mm -hmm. So it's expecting to, to return. Oh, yes. Okay. And the next thing that I want to talk about is a void function just means there's nothing expected to be an X0 that has any particular value when a function returns. But this is not a, malloc is not a void function. It's a void star function which is a slightly different sense of the word void. What this void star is, means it's an address whose type is unknown, but it's an address. It's an address to the beginning of the struct. It's an address to the beginning of something. Yeah, of something. Right. Okay, that makes more sense then. So there kind of is a return, it's just not in the sense that I was thinking. Uh, okay, okay. So I have a go ahead. So if if you replace um, x30, if you moved the address of the current function into x30 and you called the function, it would just, and then you said return at the end, it would just call itself again. Uh, yeah. So don't do that. <laughs> well, depends on what you want to achieve. <laughs> Okay. Just as so, a reminder, mostly to me, a int uses an X or a W to store. An int uses a W. Okay. Okay. 
So different groups of registers behave a little differently. So parameters are passed in X0 through X7. Now, if, uh, if you have more than eight parameters, you have to use the stack. If your parameter is something that doesn't fit in a register, <coughs> you'll have to use the stack or pass a pointer to it. Okay. And here's some other stuff. So you can never count on, if you if you call a function, if your function, your code calls a function, when that function returns, you can't count on X0 through X7 being the same value as before the function call. So if you've got something important in X0 through X7 that has to survive a function call, either put it in a different register, the 16 through 30, the not 30, or push it on the stack, uh, do a function call, and then restore it from the stack. So I actually just thought of a question. So how does the program know when you're branching, that you're not just like branching through a loop and you're doing a function call specifically? Uh, it's, it's whether or not the B is followed by an L. So okay. L says this is a function call. Okay, good to know. Right. So if, if you want it, let's say I'm, say I'm in a function that will, it'll do something fun. Um, if I want to return a bunch of values, I want to write them to or store them in the registers X0 through X7, correct? Okay, uh, could you repeat that? I do, I have a function and there's a bunch of data from it that I want to return to the main function. I want, in order to use them in the main function, I need to store them in inside the function. I need to store them in X0 through X7. No, the X0 through X7 is used to send data to a function. Okay. And then coming back from a function is only X0. Only X0. The document actually says X0 and X1, but we're, we're going to look at as if it said only X0. Okay. Okay, so if you wanted to send multi, if you think about now when you're in C++, if you have 12 things to return from a function, you have to put it in a struct because you can't return 12 things. We are not all Python here. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yeah. So in the real world, your program is running along with a bunch of other programs and processes, mm -hmm. all of which are using the registers. Careful, see So what? Careful. You're about to ask so, a question, which was like day one on operating systems. Go ahead, finish the question. Okay, I, I, I think I sort of get that part, but like are the registers, they have to be saved whenever it switches. Correct. Where are they saved to? Wouldn't it take a long time since nothing is as fast as the register? It's like in a, uh, a cache or something. Um, okay, so all, yeah. Th so th this is the subject matter of the operating systems course, uh, but let's dive in a little bit to Cephas's question. So a, a running program. Uh, are you supposed to be on the iPad right now? Yes, I am. Thank you. A running program has an address space. And its address space goes from zero to the top of memory. I don't know how big that is. Okay. And in that address space, there's an initial portion which is disallowed. Then is your code and global variables. 
then is your heap, then is your stack, and this is address space that hasn't been given to you yet. Okay. Uh, in addition to this, there's also a table in kernel memory. So this is mem physical memory. It can even be virtual memory. But anyway, it's memory that is not in your address space. So you can't get to it because it's not in your address space. So in that memory, there's going to be a table, a data structure that uh, is going to contain metadata about your running program called the process table. So your running programs process table entry is this one. It belongs only to your running program and no other. So inside there, uh, Cephas was talking about uh, something called a switch. And he was talking about the idea of having many programs running on your computer at the same time. So when the, the uh, operating system decides that it's going to switch from running your program to another program. It has code to, as part of the switch, copy all of the registers into space in your processes, process table entry. So in here is going to be a preserved copy of all of the X register, all of the integer registers, all of the system special registers, all of the floating point registers, everything. So to switch away from you, all of your registers get copied to the process table. Then to switch back to you, all of those registers are restored and you are none the wiser. You had no idea that you weren't on the CPU. Doesn't that significantly reduce the speed of using registers though? Because that's stored in memory. So we have these memory operations every whatever the time span is. Well, typically if, you're, if you have a, um, a compute bound program, the time between switches is as long as 10 milliseconds. So you're talking about billions of instructions per second. So 10 milliseconds is one one hundredth of a second. So you can execute one one hundredth of billions of instructions before one of these context switches. I suppose, but it still is a limitation. Uh, well, by the way, that's also one of the reasons why we have more cores, right? So if we have four cores and only three things that want to run, then they can all continue running. Nice. Okay. Sorry if nobody cared about what I just asked. <laughs> uh, you, everyone will have to care about it. It's an important... Uh, your question was a really good one because it raised uh, some important points. Okay, so bottom line on what registers do you have to save? Uh, you never have to save X0 through X7 unless for whatever reason you ran out of registers uh, and you're going to just uh, you know, use X0 and X7. Uh, now, let me rephrase that. If your function is going to call a function, that's when you need to be concerned about what registers get saved, what registers don't. 
if your function does not call another function, you don't have to save anything. Okay? Which is not true. You have to save from X24 to X29. And also, see where it says call E saved? So if you're going to use one of those, then save it and restore it. OK. Now, I have a, uh, I wonder how long it will take me to find it. Uh, I'll find it and uh, make a sh very short video for you. Uh, by the way, folks, there are some of the other registers that do have meanings, like X16 is the uh, 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 intra procedure call register zero. Compilers will use these. But if you're writing assembly language on your own, you probably won't. You could use them as general purpose registers. These registers will be uh, inspected by, for instance, GDB. Uh, also, X29 will be used by GDB. What's GDB? You're a debugger. Okay. Uh, just like there are rules for the X registers, the floating point registers also, some of them have to be saved, some of them don't. Okay, and that's as far as we're gonna go. Yep, that's as far as we're gonna go. Good. We finally finished that document. I'm so happy. Okay, questions? Uh, could you explain the relationship of the frame register or the frame pointer to the stack pointer? Yes. Okay. Suppose you have code that looks like this. Your notepad isn't shown. You know, doing this is difficult. It's harder than it looks. That's why I usually keep I usually keep another computer running, but I happen not to this time. Okay, so what you see here is you have a local variable called A, which will be 400 bytes long. So when your function enters, the stack will move up enough to hold uh, whatever registers like X30 and then we'll move up again uh, for another 400 bytes. Okay, that's A. And I wanna keep this line special. That's uh, your stack pointer. And then the, uh, actually, I'm gonna rephrase that. Sorry, this line is special. This is your frame pointer. So initially your frame pointer and your stack pointer are the same place. But then your code changes the stack pointer to here, and then it changes the stack pointer to here when it gives you the space for 400 bytes. The frame pointer doesn't change. The frame pointer is used by a debugger to always know where stack frames begin. So even though your stack pointer is going up and might even be going down again, even within the same function, the frame pointer stays put 
where the original, at the original location of the stack pointer for this function. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, anybody have questions about the project? We have a few minutes left. We will meet tonight if you want. Uh, uh, I'll be on Discord 7 to 9 p.m. Uh, most of, almost all of my questions are about fixing my own stupidity because I have no idea how to progress. Okay. So I'll probably be seeing you then. Okay. Other folks, questions? This questions is about the project. Kind of a dumb question, but um, you want a program in entirety in deconstructed C with the function and the main calls. And then you also want a full assembly, assembly language code with both the function calls and the main, correct? That, that's correct. Okay, just wanna make sure. Right, now the reason to insist upon the deconstructed C++ is to help you bridge, help bridge you from your higher level language to assembly language. And this is the only project where I'll ask you to do that. I have a question. Yes. Do we have to comment the C code? Because I didn't, I only comment the assembly. For you? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let that, I'll let that pass. Nice. Everybody else? No, you, you should comment the assembly language. I, I assume that you understand the C code. Do the comments have to be relating to the code or could they be about anything? You try it, uh, Jordan, and see what grade you get. I will tell you a story. Okay. Um, in the C code, you mentioned that we should take out the while loop, but when we were going over the documentation today, there were conditionals that looked like they worked like a while loop. Um, could I use that or do you want us to use the if statement? I'm, I'm afraid I, I don't, uh, I can't imagine what it is that you're referring to. Oh, I, I thought I saw something on the arms documentation that was about loop. Well, they gave you an example of in C or C++, here's a while loop. But in assembly language, it's a compare coupled with some go-tos, some branches. I think what you're referring to was like the loop thing. Like it actually said loop and then plus extra stuff. But loop was a label. Yeah, that's I, I, what he said. Loop was just a label. It was nothing special. He could have called it, I don't know, life and death. One, <laughs> one and two, those temporary <laughs> labels. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, more questions. Uh, how do we do something like check in assembly language or how do we get, how do we print what is at an address? Like I want to print what is currently at X zero, but I don't know how to print that. Uh, okay. In well, ARM. Uh, in C, you in C, in, in assembly in, language in, in C, ARM. Yeah, yeah. In semi language in C, you don't have streams. So IO stream isn't there. So instead, you want to use printf. printf so I do is like a general, what? So I do something like printf x0 or no? No. Well, first of all, printf, okay, printf has a format string. And then it has a value. And in, indeed, 
uh, there could be many values. There could be zero values. So just saying printf hello. Okay, so that has zero values. How many parameters does printf take in this case? One, where does it show up? It's a pointer in x0, a pointer to the h. If you had this one, x0 needs to be the pointer and then a one register, and it depends which one register it is, depends on the type. If this was a long, it would be x. If it was a short, it would be a w. If it was an int, it would be a w. If it was a byte, it would be a w. But it's the second parameter. Therefore, for all of these, you know that it's going to be in a one register because it's the second parameter. So if you wanted to print what's in x0, uh, you'd have to move uh, x0, uh, sorry, uh, you have to move it out of an x register, of the early x registers, because calling printf is going to blow it away. So if you wanted to know the value of x0, you'll have to put it someplace else uh, to preserve it. Okay, so then it would be an ADR for the format string into x0. I told you x0 would get blown away. And then uh, x1, it, let's say it's a long that you want to print, would be the value you want to print. Okay, now folks, it is trivial to write tiny little test programs in assembly language. If you want practice with uh, printf, tiny little 10 line assembly language. Experiment, try, learn, okay? So, um, never mind. I answered my own question. Good. But what about everyone else? Can you ask your question so everyone can hear it? Got to do more work on the, the project itself to have more questions, I guess. All right. Well, well, well when's it due? Tomorrow? Yeah, at the barbecue tonight. So. Yeah. Yeah. Could, if it's due, can you uh, by chance extend it to Monday? No. No. Okay. So I have a question, but I guess it's, a, it's, I think it's more of a me problem. So, um, so in C, in C, for some reason, I'm having difficulty um, imagining how to increment the, the address. So like, so in the my string, um, you're, you're passing um, a character string, right? Um, and then there's a while loop that tests like, okay, if the, the next one is null, uh, break off the loop and, you know, return. How do you increment the address um, of, of S? That's, I was... the, the help video that was posted online last night has exactly that. Okay, perfect. I'll just watch that video. It has exactly that and more. Just and come... th it, the class can express some gratitude to Thomas for prompting that recording. So thank you, Thomas. No problem. I had a feeling that my inane questions would probably be helpful for someone else. Okay. Cephas, you have a question? Um, co commenting on your right little test programs, I would strongly recommend that. Because like, when I didn't understand a specific command, I just isolate it from the rest of my program and then do it, make sure I understand exactly how it works. I get the right outputs. And then once I understand that, I go to the next thing until I get how to do the whole thing. And then you just sort of put it together and it works ideally. So it it's a good idea. Thank you, Thank you for me. That's, that's valuable. Okay, uh, class is at an end. Uh, I'll see you tonight at the barbecue. Good luck on your projects, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.